Hey, I'm Alice Quinn. You're watching Quintessential Comics. I'm Matt Garcia. You're still watching Quintessential Comics. <laughs> Today we got a great episode lined up for you. Um, we have our special book club edition. We do new it once a month. All the books are in the Toronto Public Library, so visit it today. Um, we're discussing The Stuff of Legend, Book 1, Dark, and The Good Neighbors, Book 1, Kin. So check it out. It's going to be awesome. You can read the books, come back to the video later, because um, there will be spoilers. We got, what else we got? We got news, we got upcoming events, we got new releases. We got it all here on Quintessential Comics. Hi guys, I'm Matt with your news for this week. Let's see, in uh, Dark Horse news, we've got uh, an upgrade for their digital service. It's now doing same day, which is uh, catching up with everyone else in the industry. So you can get uh, digital for the same day. Let's see, uh, it's a way to get back in the race. Dark Horse, get it? Huh? Huh? It's a joke. Yeah. An image, uh, Tim Seeley is giving out a free short of Hack and Slash, or Hack Slash Slash. Hack Slash. Hack Slash. That's what it is. On uh, imagecomics.com, it is the Christmas that is coming early, so go there, get uh, get your free stuff. It's cool. It's actually good. You know, we have Dave likes it, so if Dave likes it, everyone will like it too. I don't know. Now, DC News: Stormwatch is getting a new writer, which is uh, the old one, Paul Cornell, who we blah, be doing uh, new stuff like uh, Vertigo Saucer Country, which will come out. The new writer for Stormwatch will be Paul Jenkins. Paul Jenkins. Now, IDW is working on uh, G.I. Joe. Civil War is ended, and there's going to be a new Cobra Commander. And, uh, you know, being Cobra Commander is half the battle, because the other half is G.I. Joe. Yeah. Uh, Arkea, a small uh, publisher, has announced their hardcover collection for free comics, uh, free comic book day, which will include stories uh, like Mouse Guard, Rust, Labyrinth, and Cursed Pirate Girl. It's 48 pages long. It's going to be pretty sweet. It'll be in May, so uh, you have a little while to wait, but it could be fun. And finally, Marvel to bring us... Uh, Marvel to bring us to a close. Brian Michael Bendis, who's been writing Avengers for eight years, which is the longest anyone has been writing the Avengers. Dear God, let him out. He's actually getting out right now. Uh, let's see. And speaking of this, Avengers, they've announced a new crossover that's going to start with Bendis' end of run. It'll be called uh, Avengers vs. X-Men. And uh, let's see. It's going to be starting with Avengers X Sanction, and uh, it'll lead to potentially the return of Phoenix again, maybe, I don't know. Uh, we'll see Cable coming back from the future? Death place? I don't know how that works. And uh, Nova. So, that's good. Uh, Beast Wolverine and perhaps Storm will be on the Avengers side, so they're going to kind of drop the X-Men like a hot potato. And in your deaths and rebirths news, guess who's next on the chopping block? Oh, it's Deadpool, who, like, can't die anyways. Blah. So he's going to be dying in uh, issue 50. Marvel has announced this. And, uh, you know, it really sounds like they're just going to keep it going with his dead adventures, because he's Deadpool? I, I don't know. Stay tuned for more exciting updates next week. Hey, it's Alice. I got your upcoming events. Just so you know, if uh, you're looking for an event, go to t.comics.ca slash calendar. Um, we update that throughout the week. So if I don't have events now on the show, I'll have them later. So check it out. Uh, Friday, the 9th, we got the tr uh, Toronto Cartoonist Workshop Art Show. All of the, the, the instructors for that course are going to be selling all their cool artwork in time for the holidays. So check it out. It's from 7 to 11 at 587A College Street. A suggested donation of $4. It's going to charity. Check it out, guys. Art, comics, charity, booze. Did I mention their license? Um, okay, um, Uncharted Zone. It's a play with time travel. It's playing on December 8th. 9th, 10th, 16th, 17th at 7.30 at the Palmerson Library. Um, it's $20 at the door or $15 in advance, so find that event, buy tickets in advance, check it out. Saturday, the 10th, uh, the Doctor Who Society of Canada is putting together Christmas Invasion. They're, putting, they're playing all the Doctor Who Christmas specials back-to-back -back from 11.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m., 
um, and they ask that you bring an unwrapped toy to donate for the entrance fee. Monday the 12th, Geek Love is having a very geeky holiday um, from 7 to 10.30 at Austington. It's going to consist of Batman, Christmas with the Joker, Star Wars Holiday Special, and a Muppet Family Christmas. Sounds like an awesome time, man. I'm going to be there. Uh, They also ask that you bring your ugliest Christmas sweater or holiday sweater. So check that out. So Wednesday, Orchid number three is being released. Um, There's a signing at the Beguiling with Scott Hepburn himself. It's from five to seven. Check it out. It should be awesome. And those are your upcoming events in Toronto for this week. Tune in to t.comics.ca slash calendar for all of your event news. Hi guys, Matt again with your weekly releases. First off, we've got stuff from DC. Batman, No Man Land, No Man's Land, Trade Volume 1. It's a new edition. Uh, Brightest Day, Trade Volume 1. This is, uh, again, more death and return. Come on. Jack Kirby's Fourth World Omnibus, Trade Volume 1. Good stuff. We've got uh, Sandman, Trade Volume 7, Brief Lives. It's a new edition, so, you know, they're just going to release random one thing new editions because the old edition sucked so much i don't know we got superboy smallville attacks trade coming out uh superman secret origin trade also and watchmen the absolute edition hardcover 100 dollars holy crap edition if you don't have this yet i don't know you're dumb buy it and then show it off like you're cool idw news from them angel after the fall we got more uh volume four this is more uh Boreanaz for all you People who are into his chest. Captain Canuck, Complete Edition Trade is coming out. G.I. Joe, Cobra, Cobra Civil War, Trade Volume 1. That's a lot of colons going on there. You can't actually see them on the cover. But uh, Let's see, and Shaman's Tears Trade. We may have cut that one, but Shaman's Tears. It's out. Awesome. The cover's cool, maybe. Uh, Image Comic has Chew, Omnivore Edition, hardcover. That's pretty cool. I like that. Art is really nice on that one. And Girls, the Complete Collection Trade, which is a scary story about girls. And killing? They, like, turn people into eggs? It's weird. Marvel has Captain America Core Trade. And Deadpool, Volume 9, institutionalized hardcover. Get as much Deadpool as you can before he dies, and they inevitably bring him back for more Deadpool. We've got S.H.I.E.L.D. Nick Fury vs. S.H.I.E.L.D. hardcover. Again, that's the uh, premiere edition. And Spider-Man, Through the Decades trade. This is a whole bunch of collection thing from uh, Through the Decades. Duh. It's Look at the cover. Jeez. X-Men, Days of Future Past trade. That's a new printing. And finally, Ecstatics Omnibus, because everyone loves Ecstatics. That's it for your releases. Welcome to episode four of Quintessential Comics, the book club of edition. This is the book club for the month. Um, I'm gonna, we're going to introduce ourselves. Why don't you start us off, Dave? I'm um, Dave. I'm regularly the cameraman here. And, uh, yeah, it's basically it. <laughs> awesome. Hi, I'm Matt from Quintessential Comics. Here at Quintessential Comics. Hey, I'm Alice Quinn founder and manager of T-Doc Comics, as well as host of Quintessential Comics. Hello, fellow nerds. I'm Tish. I contributed one article to T-Doc Comics, and I am a bookworm here. I'm Ryan, and I'm a new intern with T-Doc Comics. It's been the first time with the book club, the bookworms. Yeah, so this is our bookworms for the week, and we're going to discuss these two books, The Stuff of Legend, book one, The Dark, and The Good Neighbors, book one, Kind. If you haven't read the books, be warned, there's spoilers. We're discussing the books because we've all read them. Um, So just hit the pause button, like right now, and come back after you've read the books, so that way we can all talk about it together. And then if you have something interesting to add, Feel free to comment below in the YouTube video or in the like the comments on T dot comics. All right. So guys, what do you think of the books? I thought they were fantastic. Um, all around, I, I enjoyed Stuff of Legend a little bit better than uh, The Good Neighbors, but they were both really really good. I'm planning on picking up the other copies, the other volumes. Who enjoyed Stuff of Legend more? Yeah, <laughs> I kind of figured you guys would. Um, when I, when I picked up this book originally, I was just, I couldn't put it down. It was so much fun. And I was just thinking, like, 
I have to share this with people. I'm not sure about you guys. I kind of read it on par with like Winnie the Pooh, where it's the little boy's imagination. Like each one of these toys represent a different part of his own personality. Like the Colonel is his own courage. The the Max the bear is his his courage and his animal side. The Jester, his Joker, and all that. Cool. Oh man, I would feel bad if that Colonel was my courage. <laughs> <laughs> no, you think about it. He like he charged right in there. He's the one that led the charge, gathered the troops, went headfirst in there. He was fully prepared to go into that darkness alone if he had to, just to save the boy. The way I looked at it was like Toy Story if shit got real. <laughs> um, <laughs> I thought of it as like a combination of Toy Story and Fables. It was really similar to Fables in the like the character dynamics, and but it had that wacky Toy Story kind of fun to it. Yeah, I kind of got that Fables vibe as well. I also like. Did anybody also notice like the World War Two sort of stuff going on? I mean, the whole comic is done in sepia tone, so it's like very obvious. It's supposed to be in a specific past sort of deal, and it's like, oh, they have to go to this strange foreign land against insurmountable odds sort of deal. And get torn in half. <laughs> <laughs> just like in World War II. <laughs> I, I really like how at the beginning of the book, they all just look like toys, and then as they venture into the dark and explore this world, they become what their character is supposed to be, like the jack-in-the-box becomes a jester, um, the colonel's able able to open his bag and write in his journal. I think it's really cool how like they can only come to life in this world where they have to like where they're out to like save their boy, where they're facing like real life situations. They actually mentioned that, and he kind of breaks the fourth wall a little bit in his journal towards the end of the first volume, where he says he's writing the journal. He doesn't even know why, because frankly, when they get out of the closet, there's a good chance that he won't be able to access his backpack anymore. Sure. Mm -hmm. I actually I enjoyed the way they drew the toys at the beginning because it wasn't in that kind of goofy toy story they they have like the ability to move around like the teddy bear can move around but they're all very much toys mm -hmm. like the colonel never really has a lot of detail to him he's a little lead figurine you never really know how he moves I assume he just floats around because his or feet like are tears. attached to a little face they do the same thing with the jack in the box uh, like when they're arguing before they go in the dark they're saying like why didn't anyone help. And Jack's like, I would have, but I was stuck in the box. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, it's also important to point out that I think what a lot of us probably thought was like super cool and badass in the comic was that the teddy bear became a big, screw-off <laughs> actual bear who like tores and tears enemies to shreds. And he still has like that world. ribbon around <laughs> yeah. his neck. Yeah. <laughs> You know what, I wasn't actually paying attention in the beginning, and I didn't know that he was the teddy bear for like the first couple pages, and I was like, oh, Jesus. I'm just glad they gave the dog a dog's name, like the dog's name is Scout. If they had given the dog any other name, I would have confused the two constantly. The dog and the bear? Yeah. Yeah. I also love how the bear kind of hates the dog initially, because the dog is like taking a spot on the bed, and he like kind of looks down on the dog, and then... The dog always looked down on him in the real world because you know he was basically a chew toy, and now back in there he's a bear, <laughs> he's a <tiny laughs> dog. Bear, yeah. Learn some respect, dog. I also kind of liked uh, the character of the t of the uh, piggy bank. I thought mm -hmm. it was really interesting how the boogeyman sort of points out that he's the smartest of the toys because he does kind of hold the key to the kid's future with the kids saving money from the piggy bank, but the piggy bank has this like. Feel it, these feelings of inferiority because like the kid smashes him constantly to take his money away. Well, yeah, yeah the idea yeah. the idea is that when you need the money, careful the piggy bank. Yeah, chuck it. Toss the piggy bank is inevitably doomed. He doesn't have the same attachment to the kid as the others would have, because yeah. he knows eventually, the kid's gonna need some candy money. Yeah, smash that piggy bank. And that's where like his cowardice comes from, because like really he's just afraid of being smashed. Well, a lot of, uh, I've seen a lot of stories where they use that type of character where it's the smart one that's kind of cowardly, but all in all, he's still trying to look out for the better interest of the group itself. Like, he honestly just believes that they're making a mistake in trying to go in there, that they're risking their lives for nothing. I'm going to go super nerdy and say he's the Gaius Baltar of self reflection <laughs> <laughs> Gaius Baltar as a, you know, 
live piggy bank. Oh, okay. <laughs> that was a Battlestar Galactica reference for any of you who didn't really know. Look it up. And I'm single. <laughs> <laughs> That's why. I just laughed because everyone else was doing it. I did not see Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> Um, anything else you guys want to say about this book? Um, I, I found the, the the piggy bank character. There was kind of a weird, like animal farm feeling to him. Yeah, like that really smart pig, and I was just like, yeah, or well, um, that, that's all I have to say. About yeah, him. there's there's actually like it's it's really cool how many draws and homages there are to other literatures within it. It's. I feel like it's a really well crafted story. I'm really upset that um, the series isn't finished. The second one is out, and you can find it in the library. Um, I'm pretty sure there's only going to be three. Um, I haven't been able to find a third one yet in the library. Um, but maybe it's out, because it takes like six months for the library to get it. So guys, what do you think? Recommended? Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Definitely. Definitely. If you want a version of Toy Story that's going to give you nightmares. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> an adult Toy Story. Why not? Yeah. Read it to your kids. <laughs> Watch yeah. them right Try. before bed. <laughs> <laughs> It's definitely a more adult sort of thing because the stakes are really high, as he probably knows from our conversation. Oh, we, didn't, we didn't talk at all about the boogeyman. No, yeah. The boogeyman oh, that's true. Yes. Oh, yeah. I get the, the feeling that really? the boogeyman is just a discarded toy. Yeah. That he's yeah. just this, this He like, was like the jaded, first toy. Yeah. He's just a jaded toy that got stuck like there, and then you come up across up. all these other... Yeah, you guys like, can like, You come across Candyland, for God's sakes. Like, how many of us have... Uh, board games that are just tossed to the back door closets. I, I loved the board game town. I thought yeah. that was really yeah. awesome. Yeah. That was awesome. I feel like like that was what showed me that this this story has a lot of depth. Like the lost toys in the closet, you can do a lot with that. Like I yeah. imagine at some point they're going to come across a bunch of like discarded dinosaur toys. Oh, and that's, and that's the thing is that they, prehistoric madness. It leaves it <laughs> so open to like uh, fabled where they take like childhood fairy tales and put them in a real world. Well. Mm -hmm. Everyone has the same generic toys, the army man, the stuffed bear, and there's just endless possibilities where they can go with what they find in the closet. Yeah, I, I keep waiting for there to be like a jungle and a whole bunch of monkeys and a, coming out of a barrel. Just yes. like, climbing over awesome. things. All right, so let's talk about The Good Neighbors. Uh, this one's different because it, instead of it being like just like like a regular fairy tale it's more like a mystical fairy fairy tale how did you guys feel about that i thought it was really cool i like i like um the whole celtic fairy lore kind of thing there's a lot to work with there um like for people watching it's not like tinkerbell stuff fairies it's like scoop spooky it's like those fairies, fairies that'll cut you yeah. like cut you mm -hmm. fairies that'll like sleep on your chest and eat your dreams or something yeah spooky fairies supernatural fairies yeah, I totally got that. <laughs> I don't know. I like the approach that they took because it wasn't it wasn't too weird. Like I thought it was a vampire thing at first. Like I don't know because you know they usually talk about kind and whatever and vampires, but it turned out to be fairies and like they wore swan cloaks and stuff, which was you know, back to that old school mythology. Yeah. I think they incorporated that mythology really well into it. Mm -hmm. Like explain and, and didn't it didn't seem really like pandery. It wasn't like they had that scene where, like, you sit down with that, you know, in, in vampire movies, the guy in those vampires is like, stick through the heart and all those classic things. Mm -hmm. It kind of, they brought the ideas of, of there being fairies and fairies existing and these things being real very naturally into it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, you can tell from, like, page one that there's something going on, right? Because she, like, what's the name here? Because Rue. 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 Rue, Rue, like, knows it to be true. She's like, there's there's something up, there's something going on, like, there's this, this isn't right. So you can totally tell from the beginning, but I really agree, I agree with you. I love the way it eases us into the story. Um, I don't know. I've never really been to, into fairies as opposed to other things, like superheroes and vampires and werewolves and all those sort of things. So it was kind of different for me. It kind of reminded me of something Neil Gaiman has done in the past because he's also worked with like fairy mythology in certain comics and it is kind of gothic, like sort of what Neil Gaiman did with Sandman. But to be honest, I don't think Holly Black is as good a writer as Neil Gaiman is. Like I haven't read anything else she's done. Uh, did anyone else notice that like meta moment in the comic? Um, there's like a box of books or something, and there's the Spiderwick Chronicles in there, which was also written by Holly Black. I don't know if I'd call that meta, I'd call that more 
product placement. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just wanted, By the way, I wrote this. I was just like, <laughs> oh, God. And, yeah. So, so this wasn't your favorite book ever? Um, well, after reading the stuff of legend, uh, and also... I read it at like fuck off o'clock this morning. <laughs> so I, I also had like trouble um, keeping up with it. I mean, there were some weird time jumps. So I wasn't sure if something was going on in a dream or if I had just skipped a page or something. I wasn't quite sure what was going on sometimes. And like the character finds out certain revelations about the plot uh, through like somebody telling her something previously very explicitly and then she hasn't taken note of it until later and then it's it's basically like if a mystery was solved by someone saying oh i heard something really weird about this person like four weeks after the fact it's yeah didn't make much sense to me i was actually in the same boat as you as i was reading it i found myself like going back and checking the page number to make sure i hadn't skipped a page <laughs> Just because there are really odd time jumps, but for me, I'm not nearly well versed enough in fairy mythology to really have been able to jump into this because a lot of it went right over my head. Like the whole uh, taking their skin, like the the first fairy that she actually speaks to, she's like, "Did someone take your skin?" I'm like, <laughs> um, "I see skin. I don't know what you're talking about." <laughs> <laughs> well, what should we call it? Um, I watch the show called Lost Girl. I did an interview with Ksenia Solo and Anna Silk on my Vimeo page. You should check it out. Um, that has a lot. It's about the Fae and the fairy <laughs> world. Spider <laughs> <laughs> I've actually and, I've, I've kept up to the first. Uh, I watched all of the first season, then like the first three or four episodes of the second season. Well, the second season isn't as good because no. they're they're <laughs> they're. <what> I stopped. <laughs> Well, they got, they got like 20-something episodes, so they can't put all mm -hmm. like the great plot points in the same part. But it's, it's the same, same sort of idea where they, they have, meet all these fairies and stuff. And the idea with a skin is that there are animal fairies that can take human form. But to take human form, they take off their skin, and they like, that is how they get back to their form. So if someone takes their skin, and they can't change back. Oh, okay. Yeah, see, if they, were given, if they had given any kind of background like that, I probably would have enjoyed it <laughs> a lot more. So you, so you didn't, so like you felt it like the, that it, it eased you into the story well and, and you just, it just went over your head. But at the same time, I made the same mistake. I read Stuff of Legends first. Yeah, <laughs> next time I'll... I, I feel like if I had read this one first, it would not have seemed nearly as uh, inferior. <laughs> I actually Harsh. did read uh, Good Neighbors first and I... I I read Good Neighbors, and uh, Matt had the copy of Stuff of Legend, and I read Good Neighbors, and I actually really, really enjoyed it. I was like, this is, this is really amazing. And then, as soon as I read Stuff of Legend, I was like, ah, I started seeing the flaws in the other one compared to that one. So I think if, if I had read that first and then read that, I'd be, I'd be giving it the thumbs down too. But I, I did enjoy a lot of it. It's, um, I see a lot of, I don't, I, don't know, I don't know if they're the first people to do whole idea of like fairies and stuff like lost girls you said that but uh they i think they do it pretty well yeah um, i could see a lot of i don't think uh there's a show out called now called grim mm -hmm. i think the person who uh wrote grim might have read this first because there's a lot of crossovers to it yeah there's a lot of like um grim type fairy tale stuff that's like it's all sort of in the same vein yeah um Another thing is that the the cough cough fable, <laughs> yeah, cough, cough, fable. fables, yeah, um, and once upon a time, which is a TV show that people think is based off of fables, but it's not. Um, so, which um I was originally drawn to this book because um, Ted Nefita is the artist, and he also did another book called Courtney Crum Crumrin's Adventures, and it was really cool. When it was the same sort of like fairy mythological stuff, but. Um, I agree with you guys that Holly Black's writing isn't really up to snuff, and she, it relies, it does rely heavily on the pictures to tell the story. Uh, you want to Speaking of the pictures, I just wanted to say that probably my favorite part of The Good Neighbors was that the art is really, really well drawn. I mean, it's good that it's in black and white, even though uh, it is a fairy world, so it would kind of make sense to have it in like vibrant colors when uh, dealing with the fairies. And I think that the fairies themselves are very, very well drawn. Uh, they're just not quite human in the face. 
their <laughs> their ears kind of stick up just a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they yeah, have these like just, long, elegant sort of ethereal looks to I, them. I do love the way the mom being, is drawn. Yeah. It's really yeah. Cool. Uh, I actually agree. Like, I love the. I actually like the black and white. I thought it added a lot of depth to it. Just, I made like the way they were able to make the uh, the obvious antagonist characters a little darker, and just a little more drawn in shadow. I just prefer to same with like the Walking Dead series. I love the fact that it's in black and white. Yeah, it. it yeah, I agree with you. Like, it makes more sense, and the art is just phenomenal. Phenomenal. The art is really great, but I, I think a lot of the, one of the big problems I saw with it was the side characters, like her, the mm-hmm. character of her boyfriend, uh, her two friends, they're not really well realized as characters. They're not seem, defined. They're, you know? they're not defined at all. They're kind of just generic tagalongs. I didn't get why the main, uh, the, the boyfriend was shying away from her until they just like spelled it out. <laughs> yeah. Because I, I had no idea what this guy was like, so I didn't really get what was going on with that. Yeah. Like he's just spooked off by this or something. Yeah, no. Um, it, there's there's three volumes of it. I've read them all. So, like, it makes more sense in, in the next volumes. But, yeah, I don't know. I feel, I, I agree with you guys. Like, I really, I enjoyed it. I liked it. Um, I feel like Holly Black's storytelling could have been better. And it would have made the story make more sense. I have uh, the two, the sec- second and third volumes at home that I'm probably going to read the second one and see if it gets just a little bit better because it was good enough to keep me intrigued and keep me interested and want to find out exactly how, like, what envelops for Rue, like who this like fairy grandfather is and what his backstory is and what his influence is going to be on her and also what ultimately happened to her mother because they kind of hint at like her mother that's not really her mother, that it's a, a replacement. They don't hint at it, they fully spell it out. They, yeah, yeah. No, at, at her the mother end, didn't actually like die. Yeah, at the end she like digs up the grave and it's like a wooden copy. Oh, okay. I, th- I figured that there's, I didn't realize that they were uh, doing that. Like I thought it was just like, the original mother was still in captivity or wherever she is. Yeah. And then mm-hmm. the fake mother just just died. <laughs> and I didn't realize that she was just a wicker. But I guess you're right. They do mention that the babies are replaced by carvings. Yeah. So um, that makes far more sense now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't See, remember. again, Holly Black's storytelling. No. <laughs> yeah, not, not a testament to her storytelling ability. But I, I, love, I love that reveal at the end, I actually. I thought that was one of the best parts of the, of the book. It was like a cool little end bit, mm-hmm. like a, a throwback to the mythology they explained earlier on. Mm-hmm. And it's definitely a, a, a good spot to end the volume because it actually made me want to read more of it. Like absolutely, I want to know what happened to the mom, like what's, what's the deal? It was a good hook. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Brief side note, was anyone else confused as to why the like gorgeous ethereal fairy mom hooked up with Rue's like super awkward like young Einstein looking dad? <laughs> well, perception of beauty. In, in the land of beautiful young fairies, the old crusty dude must seem fairly appealing because there's none of that in there. Oh, no, well, if you know any- yeah, well, if you know anything about fairies, you understand that fairies never do anything for free. So that he was rich. Yes. <laughs> they <laughs> they made a trade. Is what happened. Oh. Or there was a, yeah. Anyway, of course I have a Philistine. <laughs> um, there's also um, a, a character, a side character. He's like Aubrey. Aubrey's the grandfather, his servant. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who sort of he seems like he's trying to help Rue, but at the same time he's like bound to Aubrey. So like you never know what's going on with him. What kind of vibe did you guys get from him? I was definitely intrigued. I'm definitely, I, I'm getting the future love interest vibe off of him, um, because there's even like one time where he like sneaks up behind her and like kidnaps her. Where she there's this like little, uh, not dialogue but comment box thing where she's like, oh, I thought he was going to kiss me, sort of thing. And he does seem like he's trying to help her, but in the fairy world, people are bound to things in really weird ways, so. Um, that's, I would probably keep reading to find out A, what happens to the mom, and B, uh, what happens to him, because I am kind of interested in his character. 
I, I really liked his curse. Like, I thought that was a cool little throw in there. That, like, he, he's cursed with the fact that he will just spout, like, prophetic things mm -hmm. and not be aware he's saying it. It just comes out automatically. I think that's cool, and I'd be curious to see what happens to his character. I, I agree with him being a really <laughs> cool character in the book. I didn't get the love interest thing. I actually got, like, a, their related kind of vibe. Like, he's, like, some kind of distant relation of hers that, like, Long enslaved, lost brother. Like, long lost brother that's been enslaved by the grandpa, grew up in, like, uh, the fairy world, so, so stuck, stuck with him because of family issues. Star Wars thing going on here? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Leia reveal there. Maybe a Leia thing later on. <laughs> the vibe I got from him was kind of, like, to the grandfather, he's basically just like an absolutely sexless slave. He's he's basically a eunuch, where I don't see any potential love interest. I do know where you're coming from, where she does say like she thought he was going to kiss her, and he even says he was there for himself, not for Aubrey. Yeah. But I don't know. I just don't see him really displaying romantic emotions. Yeah. Well, he's got that whole sort of bound thing and mm -hmm. cursed, so. But everything ever has to have a love interest, don't you know? <laughs> well, it could be the boyfriend. No. But the boyfriend's a dick. I was going to say, he kind of turned into a douchebag. I don't really see that happening. Yeah. So, it's going to be the sad swamp. <laughs> <laughs> I brought you your skin back. <laughs> and there was love. I could see the I, I could see in the future the uh, the, the bound servant kind of he's like working to get his freedom or something he's got his own like uh, his own agenda involved in in helping maybe it's like to suit his own purposes maybe he's trying to usurp maybe he's usurper maybe he's gonna, <laughs> maybe he's going to be the big bad guy someday I don't know uh, or he'll join the Scooby Gang that they're making <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, anything else, guys? Anything else? Holly Black sucks. <laughs> <laughs> well, we clearly you know your Holly opinions. Blood. So, you guys. Have read the Spider Book Chronicles? Because <laughs> I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, guys, would you, <laughs> would you would you recommend this book to your friends? Depends on the friend. <laughs> I'd, I'd recommend it to some people, but I know the My frenemies? That's <laughs> <laughs> what Matt said. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I guess it depends on the friend. I'm being really harsh on it right now, but I'm sure it's not. It okay? I'm, if you've it's read Tisha's bad. review on Batman, you understand she's harsh all the time. <laughs> you gave Batman a bad review. Which Batman? Batman no. Year One, the the movie. <laughs> oh well. No, no, I I said that it was okay. It was solid entertainment, <laughs> but um, it was no revelation and we're going completely off topic. Yeah, that's cool, that's cool. You guys should check out that article Batman's on T.Comics, Batman, Batman, Batman Year One. Thanks for the plug. <laughs> that's, that's what this whole show's about. <laughs> plug my own stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and bringing the community amazing content. We hope you enjoy. So thank you for joining us on this special book club edition of Quintessential Comics. Please let us know what you'd like us all to read next month. Um, and let us know if you want to be on the show because the idea is that every month we get different bookworms on, get different fans on to talk about books of the month. Um, so yeah, send us your recommendations uh, in the comments or send me an email at t.comics at gmail.com. The lovely editors will put it on the screen down here. Awesome. Um, yeah, I hope you guys have enjoyed this show and we'll see you guys next week in the books of the month. The new books of the month will be posted next week on T. Comics. Peace out. <laughs> Peace out. So thanks for joining us today on Quintessential Comics. We hope you've enjoyed this book club edition. Let us know what you think in the comments. Because we love to hear your feedback. No, seriously, I want to know what you think. <laughs> and um, we want to thank everybody at the book club and Sean Ward and Hedda Cooper for for drawing this amazing cool awesome background for us pretty cool yeah so join us next week same time same place we got more creator interviews coming up then so thanks for joining and have a great day <laughs>